Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Well, hey, everybody, welcome back to the Deer Society Podcast. I'm Brian Lemke, joined by JJ Ducart and Andy Orr from Advanced Whitetail Systems. Uh, fitting, Andy, that you're in the studio today because we're going to be talking about the complexity of stacking habitat systems together. So water holes, food plots, cover, kind of all of the above and, and how we've seen success and all those things working together. So pretty exciting podcast today. Going to be talking about some cool stuff. Andy, how you doing, man? What's new? Good. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here and interesting topic for sure and something we deal with obviously all the time and you know, planning the the whole farm to work in those systems is really what my business is all about and um, what, you know, the future I think of deer hunting as well. That's really the direction it's heading as far as trying to understand your property and lay out as many of those systems as possible that help hold bucks on your property, help them, you know, grow bigger horns, help you harvest them, all those things combined and you know, using the systems that, that uh, you know, of, of food and water and cover and habitat and, um, you know, uh, all the different kinds of food and elements of food, it's, it really becomes uh, uh, something that's super, super interesting and something I'm real passionate about, obviously. And you guys are now passionate about now that you're, you know, working on, working on the farm all the time. Absolutely. Well, I was going to ask you to kind of introduce yourself and what you do for uh, people. I, a lot of people that listen or, or are familiar with Deer Society know who you are, but there's probably a lot of people out there that, that may not. I was going to say introduce yourself and, and what you do. You kind of did that a little bit, but yeah, what, sure. who are you and what is Advanced Right, so I'm, I'm the owner of Advanced Whitetail Systems, and what we do is um, layer in these habitat systems for people. Uh, layer in a framework of what's called hinge cutting where you're you know you're cutting trees and, and putting food and cover on the ground and then help them um, you know through consultation design a farm plan that that uh, you know makes sense for their their farm and will help them grow bigger deer and be able to harvest them better and uh, not waste a bunch of money and resources while they're doing it you know really that's where, where it comes from is because you get involved in, in starting on a farm and start doing a, a lot of different things a lot of this stuff is really expensive and can really cost you quick and you know, I've seen guys buy a tractor they don't need, a, an implement they don't need, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars of seed they don't need. And so designing those plans is really where we come in and uh, uh, making sure they're headed in the right direction, have a good plan from the start so that they don't uh, waste a lot of resources and they, they're, they're going to be successful as they implement it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's great. And I know that I've seen you work with JJ and, and the Duke Hearts and Deer Society guys on, on a lot of their farms and especially Whitetails from Scratch Farm here of, of late. And, you know, really cool to see you out there. And I've got to spend some time around you, see in action. And, and it's interesting to see the things that you look at and how you dive into a property, especially from the front end. You know, to, to just kind of hear you talk out loud about, you know, how you approach your property and looking, you know, at, at tree stand options first. And it, it's just really cool to see. And obviously, you've had a lot of success doing it. So um, definitely want to talk to you about a few things uh, during this podcast. Um, we can talk about the Whitetails from Scratch property and some different things. But, mm -hmm. you know, let's talk about um, first big farms, small farms, you know, different size farms. Do, are you a believer that no matter what size the farm is that, uh, or property per se, uh, that you can do something to improve your chances on, on hunting. Yeah, I would say a hundred percent. I believe that there's no question. I've seen it over and over and over and over. You've got to kind of change your frame of mind as far as a property goes, whether it's 20 acres, 500 acres, 2000 acres, all of them can be improved. A property is just, a, a, in a way, it's kind of a raw material that you can change and, and tweak and start to implement different aspects of, you know, as we spoke, all these different habitat improvements. And they all help. They'll all help hold more deer. They're going to help deer grow bigger. They're going to help you harvest them uh, more effectively. All those components. And that's the, the essence of the whole thing. And that's what becomes so addictive for so many guys is when you get involved in this and you start it's just, it's kind of a rabbit hole of like, my gosh, there's so many things I can do and it becomes so enjoyable um, it, because you feel like you're actively doing things to, to improve your chances. It, it, it almost is if you're, you're, you turn your hunting season into uh, 365 days a year or however much you can get out there to, to make those improvements, it, it, it increases your enjoyment of the whole thing. So absolutely. I've seen 20 acre, pro I've seen 10 acre properties improve. That's a part of how, why I started all this. I had 10 acres that I lived on in Montana for a while and uh, started playing around a little bit and, and, you know, messing around a little bit of food and, and a little bit of hinge cutting and stuff. And it was just, 
amazed at the changes it made in, in no time at all. And uh, I still get pictures from the people that own that property now of all the deer that live on it. It's so incredibly satisfying. What do you think is kind of the ballpark of the most um, efficient or optimized property somebody like a single person could have acreage wise, you know, to do work and see the return. So say you got 10 acres, you know, you mm -hmm. do a little bit of work and almost like you're done, you know, you're at max potential, 200 acres. And maybe you do work and it takes continual work. And it's like, you know, that's like the maximum out output a person can do to maximize the potential mm -hmm. of that property. 2000 acres. It's almost like way too much, you know, like there's just acres and acres of land where you're not touching it. Right. Um, so like, what's kind of that sweet spot? If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, interesting question. Of course, it would depend on, is it just one person? Or is it like average, you guys? I'll say the average client. Yeah, the average client <laughs> usually usually has is surrounded by at least a couple, three people that are involved or help them. And of course, there's sometimes there's more when uh, the bigger the property is. They, they've, they've recruited more help and whatnot. But it varies. It does vary for sure. I know I'm thinking right now of one guy that I know that has a thousand acres and it's pretty much just him that does it all, but he's highly motivated and extremely, you know, focused on, uh, and, and, and got the, you know, got a large tractor to help out with some of the food plot situations. And of course he hired me to do the hinge cutting and things. So it would depend on the ratio of what you're willing to hire done versus if you want to try, you know, some people might want to try and do it all themselves. And that's a totally different deal. But, you know, as far as what one person could do and do all this stuff you talk about, like do the hinge cutting and do the, you know, well, like, dig so the pond or the skid loader and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. If you had a hundred acres <clears throat> and let's just for easy numbers, you get 10 food plots on it. Is the person with a thousand acres going to plant, you know, 10 times more food plots? Or well, is that just like way overboard? You know, you're just spinning your wheels. You only have right. You know, I mean, do, you know, you I balance usually, that. Right. I I love to see usually you know maybe a food plot for every you know forty acres or so something like that in that realm. So you can kind of scale that somewhat. And of course, those systems that we're trying to plan. The the systems I'm planning, I'm not focused on. You know, oh, this is a two hundred acre property, so that changes a bunch of things. It comes down to I want those systems in as many places as I can to create a flow. It changes the flow of the property. And whether that's 200 acres or 2,000 acres, there's going to be obviously more systems on a 2,000-acre farm that work together all as one large system. But I would say no, you know, it, it's, not, it's, it's not overkill to, as your property size increases to increase your amount of food plots and whatnot. But, it, you know, if somebody has 10 acres and it's, and it's really laid out well, they might have three food plots on it all really, really small, taking advantage of certain things. But most likely it's probably just going to be one. And you might have somebody that has 200 acres, and depending on how that property is laid out, if it's all ag ground and just a tiny little bit of timber or something, very thing, various things, it might they might only have two or three on that property. It just, it just varies on what the property is and what its makeup is, and that's kind of where we get involved usually. Is it's, the dynamic of that is, becomes really challenging to understand. As far as, okay, what, what do I do on this property? Because it's not at all the same as the other property. Some properties are sim similar, but they're basically all different. So really, you got to get involved and get, you know, kind of get your feet wet on, okay, as we spoke about before, where, where can they access this property? How can they get on it? You know, what parts of the property can they as access effectively for hunting? And that, that really determines a starting point. And then, okay, now our timber component and what's the quality of that? And Okay, that dictates, okay, how many deer approximately I think I can hold in those areas. And so therefore, we might need two food plots feeding that or three or one or what, you know. That, that's really the dynamic and the part that keeps me interested in this business is because uh, it's never the same. And every, every single farm, you're trying to design as effectively as you can, but they're all different. The, the trees are different. The grasslands are different. The, you know, where you can put pond, on and on and on. It's so really, really complicated, so. So perfect. Let's let's dive into that a little bit. And mm -hmm. you know, when you when you look at a property and you go to apply a manager or, or a system to it, um, you know, from from my perspective, I see there's a few main things that, that you're looking at, right? You're obviously looking at food, so we can talk about food plots. You're looking at water, uh, you know, both necessities of of the animals that are on your land. And third thing is cover. So food, water, cover. What else am I missing in there as a necessity? 
for things that you would want to look at or include into these systems? Yeah, in the design phase, I'm not overly concerned. You know, obviously human pressure in the long run is, is a factor and, and outside pressure and neighbors and things like that. But as a framework for the farm, you know, we're looking at, I'm looking at uh, the timber component, what we can do as far as does it need some logging? Where can we do hinge cutting? What, what's, what is the makeup of the trees? Are a lot of food trees? Or are they just, you know, going to be more cover uh, type of situation? Try and understand where that starts and... Yeah, no, that's good. So uh, here's a question for you. So when you approach a farm like that and you're looking at food versus cover ratio, do, is there any kind of like uh, science that you put behind it at all? I know guys talk about, well, 80-20 rule or, or, you know, different things when it comes to food versus cover. Mm-hmm. Um, what would you say is kind of the average um, approach there for you or does it differ by every property? It, it certainly differs by every property. Every single property is really, they're quite different and that food component is, you know, highly dependent on the, the, the species of trees, the size of those trees, whether we're doing logging project first to, to get some of the marketable trees out first um, <clears throat> and trying to understand, okay, what am I trying to feed with this? Where's the tree stand location? So all those things kind of work together and that, you know, it gets a little complicated, but basically trying to understand how many, how many deer do I feel like I can bed in this area? How much will this food help them? What food can we have close by and tree stand locations with, you know, uh, food plots and ponds situation going on and how can those things work together? You know, I don't want to overcut an area and have too much, uh, too much hinge cutting in an area that I can't effectively hunt and be, and, and have some great, uh, hunting locations close by, uh, for different winds. Hopefully it would be the optimum, you know, maybe something a little on the South side and a little more on the North side situations East. So you hunt West, you know, variant winds or whatever, all those factors kind of come into play and, Try and understand, just like on you guys' Cedar Spring farm, you know, that's a prime example, that eastern side of the farm. That's a, that's a you know, obviously going to be a major sanctuary area. And so then it's just a matter of, all right, how do, you know, can we hunt it effectively? And that's a, that was a fairly simple uh, uh, component to understand because that's the, that's the eastern side of the property. And it, it's a, l- a perfect little chunk of timber to bed, you know, whatever, 20, 30 deer and, and be able to hunt them effectively. So... We want a mature buck to take over that area and command that area and grow two, three, four, five, seven, eight, ten years old. Whenever you guys decide, maybe you want to chase him, or whenever you get a crack at him, you know, kind of thing. Have have a buck command that area and really uh, take it over. And then obviously over to the west, there's um, you know another big chunk of timber, and we're going to do this kind of try and do the same thing there. Get some flow established between the two, and so doing that all at the same time is kind of the. That's so why it gets a little, a little dynamic at times, you know, trying to understand, okay, how is this one and the next one and the next one, how are those going to work together? And kind of probably why I have a job. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm interested in on, on your, your take on this next part. So, you know, when somebody takes their property and looks at what they, they should maybe be doing or how they can improve it, you know, an, an easy solution is, okay, let's put in a food plot. Or mm-hmm. some, you know, the next my guy, guy might say, okay, hey, I'm going to put in a water hole over here. But then we could take it one more step and say, okay, well, if we're going to put in a food plot here, does it make sense to put in a water hole? So now we're talking about stacking these different elements, um, you know, and putting putting as many resources as you can in one area. So talk to me about times where you've seen success or you've maybe put a food plot in and put a water hole in. Is that something that you do a lot? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we do it an awful lot. Um Again, it comes down to, you know, I have to think of a, maybe a buck's uh, laying over in that hinge cutting 100, 150 yards away over a ridge, whatever. And you can, you can access that location and get in there, um, you know, stealthy, quiet with the right wind and they, they can't see you kind of situation. Well, now you start talking about, okay, we've got a perfect location for, um, you know, a, a nice food plot. Um, maybe we'll put two elements in that food plot, you know, might be some, some more green type food and maybe, maybe some beans if you can fence them in or have them tied into an ag field or something. Um, and then of course, I'm immediately gonna want to put in a small pond. And we have a lot of guys misunderstand when I say pond, I don't mean an acre, I don't mean a half an acre. I mean, you know, a pond the size of, you know, maybe eight feet by eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet long, very, very small, the size of a, of, of a vehicle more or less, uh, but usually make them kind of round or, you know, kind of, it varies, but, Getting that water and that food combination together is so incredibly valuable for deer, um, mature bucks included, that, it, you know, it's a, it's a gigantic advantage because when you've got that hinge cutting or, you know, those components close by and now you're, you've got a deer that can get up and 
uh, on his feet within 75, 100, 150 yards, be at a quality food source and a water source like that, then you stand, you know, your, your, your probability of having him do something like that in daylight hours so that you can get a shot just skyrockets, you know, and, and we've seen, we've all seen the video. I mean, you know, how well that can work. And so that's really one of the, one of the main components of that. And then trying to understand how all those little systems, the little uh, uh, cells can work together to create a larger movement pattern on the farm. Th those two things go together hand in hand. I, I, I like the idea of putting uh, water holes with food. And I, I can tell you one thing that I've noticed is um, when you have a water hole, and this works a lot for, for bigger food plots, bigger food sources, and when you have a water hole there, it becomes like a centralized social area. So over there in Wisconsin, we do a lot of filming over there at Homegrown Outfitters, and pretty much every single food plot that they set up, there's a water hole on it. And I can tell you that you know, filming over there and, and lots of different experiences I, I've had. It's like a deer comes out in that food plot and you hope he's going to make his way towards you, you know, but you're, you're looking at a big open area. There's a water hole there. Man, I would say more times than not, that deer is going to end up right there at that water hole. It becomes a social area and he's got to come there for water. So it, it just, to me, it makes sense to add that water hole. It, it just creates that, that extra ounce of enticement to get that deer where you want him to. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I know JJ, you have a lot of experience with that. And I mean, you know, you think about both Colton and I, uh, you know, I killed a 227. Colton had to one up me and killed a 228, uh, uh, both over, you know, small water holes like that. They're a huge focal point for uh, white tailed deer and bucks for sure. No question about that. And when you combine that with food, um, you know, it's something they absolutely can't resist. And of course, as soon as deer drink, a lot of times they're prone to urinate. So they're communicating in those areas heavily. There's generally a lot of scrapes uh, on, on trees or bushes around them and whatnot. So it's just, it becomes a giant hub for them for sure. And you combine that with food as well and other quality hinge cut food close by, you really got something that's dynamite for a white-tailed deer. And, and again, like I said, we kind of want to focus on, hey, let's let's get a, a singular buck that's, that'll capture this area. They generally will take it over and it's the same as you and I. Would you want to get up and go to your sink to get a drink of water that's 700 yards away? No. Or would you just move your couch over within 10 yards of the, the sink so you could get a drink fairly easily? That's just what they're doing. Is It's a convenience issue. If you've got great bedding close to a great water source and food source like that, that's a, that's a gigantic component of really, really helpful, you know, for sure. Yeah, we've definitely seen the um, <clears throat> impact waterhead. I mean, I shot my buck in an area where we put a little water hole. Now, we were using tubs that we were kind of digging in, 200 mm -hmm. gallon, 250 gallon. I forget how big they were. Because it's, you know, some of these spots, it's not a natural water holding. You know, there's no natural mm -hmm. drainage. It's a high spot. The soils are not great for holding water. So how do you combat that if you choose not to do, you know, a tub uh -huh. What's your experience with that, and how do you? Yeah, kind of line, you know, that? a lot of guys end up using liners, and uh, they're not, you know, on, again, if you're going to try and put a liner in a one acre pond, that's a pretty serious undertaking, and it's you know, be quite expensive as well. But when you're putting a, a liner in a pond that's eight feet by eight feet, or even six feet by six feet, um, you know, they're relatively inexpensive. You can get liners, you know, uh, various thicknesses, and um, so the deer don't, you know, the deer's hooves are a little bit sharp, and if you get something really thin, or I've had guys try and use tarps. And they'll punch a hole in it, you know, in just a matter of a few hours. <laughs> so uh, using an actual liner is a better way to go. But, uh, you know, people that are a little bit more, more up north with more, um, uh, like, decomposed granite-type soils and things like that, they won't hold water, and so you'll have to put a liner in them. But I, I haven't had the world's greatest experience with tubs. Um, I, there's no question they work. Um, some bucks will tolerate them, but I've definitely seen – a percentage of bucks that do not tolerate them and will not approach them, unfortunately. <clears throat> in general, deer will. Uh, the does don't seem to have too much of a problem in younger bucks and whatnot, but uh, uh, definitely a percentage of the time, mature bucks will not approach those very well. They don't like them. And also there's the aspect, a lot of times the tubs, you know, if it's like half full and it's buried in the ground too, you know, they really got to get, they got to put their front hooves clear down in it to yeah. be able to drink. <clears throat> and so a um, bit of an awkward situation, but I, I'm not a huge fan of the tubs, but I know some, some people are. So I go. got some interesting stories from this year, just experience. So we put in a bunch of these tubs and the problem is they dry up and the, cause the deer drink yeah. all the water fast. Yeah. And then you got to you know, drive around and try to fill them up every mm -hmm. two weeks. And if there's no rain, then you got to fill up the tub. Yeah, which is human intrusion. Kind of a you don't want. PIA, um, a pain in the, you know. Um, 
But we had pretty good luck with a lot of the bigger bucks coming in and using them. Um, if you can't see it from your stand, they will alert you when a deer's there because you hear the clink, 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 clink plastic. The deer, you know, clankety sound, yeah, on the edge of it, and they'll dive into it if it gets low. I've seen deer. I got video of them actually. Some pretty good reveal where they, the smart deer, smart bucks, put their feet down on the bottom. They stand in it and just drink and walk away, and the other deer struggling, figuring out how to get yeah. in there and use it. But yeah, the the problem we or that I saw at least from the cameras, it took a while for them to get used to it. Some of the deer didn't like it. They eventually, you know, after a month or two, the local deer are like, well, I got everything else I need here. I think I'm going to use this water. Yeah. <clears throat> so they got used to it. But yeah, filling it up was just probably the worst, yeah. worst part of it by far. Yeah, and it creates, you know, human intrusion now in an area that we want zero, zero human intrusion. That super core area, you know, you, you the only time you want to be in there is during, absolutely during, you know, those peak hunting times when you're going to catch a buck, a, a super mature buck that's going to come into that spot and want to drink and whatnot. So yeah, they're, they're problematic in some ways. I don't recommend them really. I know guys, some guys use them, but uh, I don't recommend them. And I'd much rather see guys put in a, pond, a small pond with a liner and then just never have to return because it's, it catches enough rain just to, to keep at least, you know, whatever, six or eight, 10 inches of water in there. And and continue to give the deer what they want as far as water, but you zero intrusion. That's such a horrible area to, to intrude yeah. on, you know, because that's the one area we want them to have total trust in. Like, oh, I can go there anytime I want and drink water. Nobody ever sees me. You know, nothing's ever there. You know, that's really a, a key component for sure. Yeah. Human intrusion is, in general, is just you know one of the can be one of the the toughest things to beat on your property. You know, I, I get a lot of guys that have farms that they have. Um, beautiful mowed grass roads all over the place that they've, you know, kind of, they were either there when they got the farm or they've put them in over time and, oh, you know, we've got to keep those roads, you know, cleaned up and whatnot. And they're mowing and mowing and mowing all over the place, all over the whole farm. And it's just catastrophically destructive to a mature buck's ability to feel safe when he's laying in his bed and all of a sudden, he hears the mower coming and it, it's over. He's not going to bed there really anymore because he's just done with like, hey, this is not, this is not the kind of solitude that I'm looking for. So, a lot of times I'll end up recommending, you know, removal of 50%, 70% of the grassy roads on properties that lead all over the place, or at least just let them overgrow and, and uh, you know, maybe mow them once a year or something, mm -hmm. just so that you're reducing that. The human footprint is just gigantic. And so that's that's another part of the problem with the tubs, for sure. And a lot of times they, they crack and break, and so you got, you're in there replacing it again in two or three years, just more human intrusion. And those bucks are paying attention to every bit of it. For sure. Yeah, I would say, yeah, it's definitely a pain. It was nice to be able to go in. You know, if someone doesn't have big equipment, they can at least do something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think um, long term. And that's term, generally, that's a lot of the guys that I hear that are doing it, you know, it's, and even on a property that maybe it, it's not even their property, that, but they ask the, you yeah, know, the landowner, true. hey, can I put a little water hole thing? You know, you, you start talking about, oh, can I dig a pond back there? What? No, can't do that. That's crazy. But you can put a little tub back there and get, you know, get the draw of it and whatnot. And that's, that's some areas where it's pretty effective. So how do, you, how do you compare a little secluded pot with a little secluded plot with a little water hole compared to a big destination plot, which I know Brian has a bunch of experience with, with a huge pond? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the things are even, can even be compared. I, mature bucks don't like them. Uh, big open ponds and open areas like that, you'll see deer drinking out of them. But there's a there's a there's a thing that happens when you've got little ponds. And we try and put I, a lot of times I put them in the timber. They're in the timber where that's an important aspect of it actually because the sun pounding on a pond right, yeah. yeah dries it out super fast. So if you can get it in the shade, that's really important. Uh, I won't really speak about the temperature of the water. I don't think the deer care as much, but it definitely they will evaporate way faster when they're in the sun. And of course, we all know by now, I'm sure the evaporation causes, you know, mud flats on the side where the EHD midges and whatnot can be a problem sometimes. So overall, I try and put them anytime I can in shade. And we've even planted trees around them to, to have them, those trees develop and eventually have the pond in shade. If you don't, if it's a grassy area or an open area, you don't have anything, you know. So I think that's an important component, but I got lost in my own thought. I don't know where where, I can't remember yeah, what you asked. Yeah, big versus small. You know, big oh, yeah. I, I, the, the big ponds, I mean, deer will definitely drink out of them. Mature bucks drink out of them at night and whatnot. But 
um, that that cover. You know how important it is as a whitetail buck, uh, the mature bucks. They just they don't like breaking cover at all. And so if you can have your uh, a little pond, little just because it's easy, right? I mean, if I could, I, I might put a half acre pond in the timber and you could hunt it or whatnot. But it'd be a, a huge undertaking. But you can take a skid steer and make one of these ponds in an hour. Right. And then it, very simple, very relatively inexpensive. If you have, maybe have to put a liner in, it might be 100, 100 bucks, 150 bucks or something. And now you've got a, a small pond that's in the timber, in the shade that bucks feel entirely secure approaching because it's, it's in the cover. They do it every day. Nobody ever sees me. You know, they're, they're a, an animal of, of extreme stealth and they don't like to just walk out in the open. They don't like it. So that's been my experience. I'd love to hear what, what what's your experience been with large ponds versus small. Right? Yeah, well, before I, before we get to that, I want to just jump back real quick to the tarp thing because I have actually used tarps quite a few times and seen a lot of people use tarps. Pat Reeve he used to put in a crap load of water holes, and they were all really successful, and he would use tarps. Mm -hmm. thing was, always a couple things. One, he always bought the heaviest tarp that he could find. Mm -hmm. He'd double it up, and then he'd always make sure that there was enough dirt to put on back on top of that tarp and then he'd take a four wheeler or whatever we had and run it over, run it over, run it over and pack that dirt on top of that tarp mm -hmm. as much as possible. So hopefully those deer weren't getting down to the tarp to be able to poke their hole mm -hmm. or poke their hoof through it. Now I, I, same thing. I agree. If you have an exposed tarp, deer are going to poke their foot through it and it's going to be done. But I have seen a lot of success and personally had a lot of success using tarps, double them up, find the heaviest one you can buy and and use that because I, I think it, it can work if you don't have the opportunity to get a liner. Obviously, a liner is going to be a better option, um, but if you're yeah, trying and to, really, on uh, most of the time they're not going to be any more expensive. You know, if you are buying the heavyweight tarps and whatnot, they're not cheap either. Yeah, you know, sixty, eighty bucks, and yeah. now you're into the price of a liner, especially yeah. if you're doubling them up. Yeah, absolutely. I think, so, and a lot of times, honestly, the 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 liners are made also out of a different material. Uh, that's the like kind of rubber. I don't know what the the actual chemical compound is or whatever, but they're rubber and they have some give. And like I said, they won't. They just can't put. They're they're pretty much a permanent installation. If you if you make a pond with one of those liners, they're uh, I have great experience with like BTL liners. They're really really good. And, nice. Um, where where does somebody get a liner like that? Like I said, BTL makes great liners like that. I, I'm sure there's other companies, but we've, I've had good experience with them. And they make they must make forty different kinds thicknesses and different kinds for different applications they make liners for like landfills and all sorts of things like that but they sell small ones too so no that's all good stuff but back to your <clears throat> initial question there big ponds versus small i mean the the small water holes are killer and and you know i think it's one uh, a lot of what you have you said originally it's you put them in cover you know big mm -hmm. bucks like cover you know so you, you create them in those areas that are advantageous to you. Um, you know, but you, you hear this question a lot, well, or you'll hear somebody say, I don't need a water hole. I have water on my property. I have a stream, right? I have a big pond. Well, one, you're not, they may not be in the spot that's perfectly advantageous for you to take advantage of it and hunt it, right? So you can put these small water holes where you want them. The second thing is, I don't know what it is, and I don't know if you were going to get to this, Andy, or not, but like... Those small ponds, a lot of times, especially when they're in timber, they get all that leafy matter in there. They get all this different stuff and they, they become, I think, mineral rich, right? So like I've seen deer, I've filmed deer walk across a perfectly good clear running stream, right? To get to a water hole and drink out of it. And I think that has a lot to do with, uh, one, the, the social atmosphere that a small pond creates, but I, two, I think that those ponds with all that matter and stuff sitting in there, I think it becomes a mineral rich environment that those deer like to drink out of. Have you experienced that at all? Yeah, it's one of the most, it, it's, it's a real sticker for me because it's one of the things I deal with all the time. <clears throat> I have, I'm constantly trying to get landowners to understand that they're different. The deer prefer them, and I can't say why. I'm not sure. It could be the mineral component. To me, it could be flavor. You know, I have certain waters when I go to the store. Oh, I love Aquafina, but boy, I can't stand Ice Mountain or whatever. People have their water that they prefer the flavor of. I don't know if that's a component, too. Um, another factor to me might be the fact that most of the time, the little streams and creeks are down low where they can't see well. And I think they're uncomfortable drinking when they can't see well. They're, they're in a, a, a position where they can be ambushed sometimes fairly readily. Another component may even be that a lot of times little streams and creeks like that, they make noise. 
So that reduces their ability to hear something approaching them possibly. I don't know. There may be those four factors. I don't know what ratio, the percentage, they, but it's definitely, there's no question. I've seen it over and over and over. A small pond will massively outproduce a little creek uh, as far as drawing deer to it. And then there's a second component too. That you, uh, you touched on it. You can, you can have them where you want them. In other words, even a big pond. Yeah. When was the last time you saw a big pond that had fantastic uh, tree stand trees all around it? Or an opportunity to put a food plot in that, that was excellent. You know, in other words, you can you can use these little ponds, pop them in where you want, right where you want them, and just I mean, you, you're locked on. You know, you've got a fantastic setup right where you want it. The pond's 15 yards or 18 yards from the tree stand, right in that slam dunk shot mode. You know, and here they are distracted a little bit, drinking, giving you a perfect broadside shot. If you know, hopefully, and it, it's. It's something I, I just hammer and hammer and hammer on all the time and because I've seen so much success with it, you know, um, on farms. Guys over and over and over, you know, just having fantastic success on little kill ponds, you know. Yeah, two really good takeaways there too. One, so when you're building your ponds, make sure that you have a, a nice, easy, gradual slope around the edges. So a deer doesn't, don't make them, you know, the edges where they're super steep, where they have to bend way down and it limits their visibility. I, I think you're right. I think deer like to be able to look and see with their peripherals and not have their, their head completely, you know, dove into a, a hole when they're drinking. I think that makes them a lot more comfortable. So make sure you have a gradual slope to, to the edges of your pond. And two, that's another big advantage of a water hole. So a, a small water hole, right? Small water hole, you put it where you want it and you can shoot all the way around it. So if a deer comes to get a drink, it doesn't matter if he's on your side, the other side, which side he's on. You can, if you're hunting with a bow, you can probably get a shot at him. If you're hunting over a half acre pond, an acre pond, that deer come out and drink wherever, you know, and you can't shoot that whole pond, right. you know, so it really, really targets where those deer are going. I, I will say, JJ, to, to your other question about big open areas, you know, I've seen where, you know, guys are putting ponds in these open areas. And I agree, the evaporation thing is is tough, but I, I have seen them work really well, the small, small water holes out in the big open, open stuff too. If you can keep the water in there, Again, it almost seems like it, you create that social area. You you create it's it, it almost has the same effect as not the same effect, but like a rubbing post, for example. So you talk about adding another element into uh, you know this deck. So like over there at homegrown, they'll put food plot, they'll put water hole, and then there'll be a rubbing post right there too. So just anything that they can use to communicate there. I see even without the rubbing post, I see these little water holes as like. Areas where deer want to go, they end up there, they drink, they have to urinate, they're leaving scent there. So it's creating this social environment for these deer. I think if you can keep water in them in open areas, in certain circumstances, they can work really well too. Again, if you can put them in cover, put them in cover. Yeah, I think they're, I definitely think they're better in cover. And I, I just want to touch on one thing. You, when you were, a minute ago, you were talking about <clears throat> making the sides of your pond shallow. I, I would say that with a caveat, just make just the part shallow that gives you a broadside shot because the the midges and whatnot you know you don't want to create like a mud flat type of scenario we do generally want it to be sort of sort of sharp sided but but then on the you have a nice ramp on the where where that deer will be broadside for you in the tree kind of situation that works that works amazing yeah i was gonna say i got a couple things i think you know maybe some of those big water holes on the tops in those big egg fields are so powerful in certain situations because there's no other water around. You know, you have large area, big food plots, the nearest water is probably down in those big bluff bottoms. So, mm -hmm. you know, location, that's a pretty powerful it's draw. It's huge. And, sure. and even a, an add-on to that is you'll see the does and the younger bucks are willing to use it, but what you notice is the mature bucks won't until after dark. And that's why they're a problem. You know, that doesn't help you as a hunter, you know. Yeah, but we've got when you have those little ponds that are close to a you know good heavy cover and whatnot, they feel completely secure approaching them in the daylight. I mean, you know, that, obviously we video all our hunts and whatnot. We wouldn't have that video of that. You know, it would it would all be after dark if that was not the right. case. So they're willing to approach them in daylight hours. Is yeah. I think the difference. A big a big open pond in the middle of the field that generally won't. I got one more water question, then maybe we'll move on, but. What's your experience with ponds? I'll call them ponds, but that are fed by springs. 
So there's more of a continual flow. You probably have an overflow pipe mm -hmm. compared to, you know, just a water hole, I'll call it, or even just a swampy pond. Right. I would, I still would lean on the little, the little, for whatever reason, the little swamp holes are, are, are generally the best, but a spring pond, if it's in a good location, it's going to work too. And have you built any of those? Do no, put in, not okay. spring ponds. No. Yeah. Yeah. It just seems like it's a tricky thing. If someone were to try to, you know, build a pond, dam it up. Then they got this constant flow, overflowing, yeah. washing out the bank, and really. really yeah, you just have to put. You have to put a, 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 a um, what are they called? Overflow. An overflow yeah. pipe in it. I have to install a full overflow pipe, and depending yeah. on the size, you made it. But I don't see why it would be a problem. I mean, if that overflow pipe, then, pipe is plenty big to capture not only all the spring water but all the drainage that it might get, then it should be fine. Did yeah, you so have problems washing them out with them washing no, out? No, I'm just curious because of future. Ideas, but I know I know where that I know where that spring is. Yeah. I know what <laughs> you're talking some spring. about. You got a spot in mind? <laughs> I've drank out of that spring. <laughs> I know exactly where it is. You get sick? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, so potentially it's going to fill up more so because you got that spring fed. Maybe that helps with the midges too. Is where kind of my mind was hitting when you talked about the EHD. You yeah, know, you're not getting in that a spring. Low. Yeah, in a spring fed pond. So maybe I don't, I don't believe you'll have any problem with midges. Disadvantage preferred less potentially. Mineral wise, slight, but slight, just slightly could potentially decrease EHD. Hopefully, yeah, definitely going to decrease EHD, and it already exists. You know, it's already there, so you don't have to worry about oh, did it not rain enough, and now it's all completely empty and turned into mud. With a spring fed, it's always going to be there. And I know it, what we were talking about. I know that that uh, spring is in heavy cover, um, and You're should be about the pipe. Yeah, should be highly approachable by deer. They, they should feel very comfortable coming in there. The only problem you got, I think, is there are no tree stand trees in there, but. You figure something out. Lose weight. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sapling Bob. <laughs> I think there's one pretty good one. There's one pretty good one in there you could probably get in. But I just yeah. remember being a little sparse. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little, a little sparse. sparse. But you could, you know, a, a box blind situation or a ground blind, a lot of options. Yeah. yeah. There's certainly something that will hold a decent ladder stand, so you could do that for sure. Is there any reason that you would put in a food plot and not recommend to put a pond by it? Uh, only um, as far as the, the overall number. Um, I might have a situation where for the wind reasons, I want to have two or three food plot situations pretty close to a bunch of hinge cutting. And if I, I, I won't put a pond in and, and 75 yards away or 100 yards away have another pond, but I will with a food plot. As far as I, I generally, whatever, in other words, whatever the, the most advantageous food plot situation is that's the one i'm going to put the pond in because i want to you know you're trying to multiply kind of trying to multiply your your success type of deal i don't want to have i don't want to go to the extra effort to have okay well this one has one and that one has one too well obviously any deer that's 75 yards away can walk and get some some water so whatever whichever uh and i can tell you this whichever one has the pond i'm gonna hunt that one a hell of a lot more <laughs> Well, I know you've been to the Wisconsin farm with me. You yeah. created a plan for us there. <clears throat> we were looking at your footage earlier. You're hunting a property called the wetlands. So thinking about swampy areas, I know it's been tough for me to, you know, wrap my mind around adding water right next to swamps, but there's always seems like certain parts of the property where there's, you know, it's the higher spot or it's away from the swamp or mm -hmm. there's just no water. And that's the area where, yeah, add a couple water holes and it's just in, like an instant magnet because those oh, deer... Yeah are bedding there and they're starving for water. I mean, they're just yeah. thirsty. Well, and, 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 you know, and the it fact seems like that, that is a, um, a common thing almost anywhere, even next to like our swamps in Wisconsin, get mm -hmm. away from that little bedding knob. Yeah. They need water over there. Yeah. It, it's a convenience issue. A lot of people forget about that. How, how, you know, I mean, look, we have, we have refrigerators with a freaking water dispenser on the outside of it. There's a sink four feet away. Doesn't matter. This water tastes a little bit better. It's a little bit colder. <laughs> I like it. So it's a convenience issue. When you make, and, and a deer is, for deer, it's way more important. You know, you and I, we can get food, water, anywhere we want it, anytime you want it, blah, blah, blah. They're walking around, you know, predators pursuing them, trying to make it and, and trying to survive, you know, and they, they, they're an animal. They need to spend large amounts of time bedded, digesting food. When they get up and they need a drink, they need to get it fast and get away from there because it's a focal point for, you know, it can be a focal point for predators at times. And so they want to get a drink quick and get the heck out of there. And so it's an issue of convenience, you know. If you drop down into that swamp and you're down in all that gummy stuff trying to find some decent water, now you're, you know, you're down low. You can be approached by predators that are up high and got you spotted. 
versus, hey, the convenience of this pod is literally 15 feet from the food plot that I'm eating in. It's a, just a tremendous uh, convenience aspect. And they're, they're not, that, that doesn't fall on deaf ears with deer. You know, they really do pay attention to, hey, this is, I don't have to walk clear. If you have to walk 150 yards downhill and down to that swamp and then walk back out, that's a lot of energy. And they're an animal that's already, you know, they don't have a lot of extra energy to burn. You know, they're trying to survive. So the convenience of, oh, this pond's really easy. It's just a few feet away. It'll get them every time. Especially the mature bucks because they're, you know, a lot of times they're big old fat boys. They don't want, they're not interested in walking 150 yards down a hill to go get a drink if they can just waddle over to that pond right there, you know. And those, those ponds in the timber too, like during the rut, would be just solid. I mean, money. Mm-hmm. I, I can remember I was sitting in Wisconsin and I had this, uh, walking in my stand in the dark and I could hear this buck chasing this doe and I'd go and rah, 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 and I'd get it far away and I'd go and I'd, they'd be getting closer and I'd stop and wait and it's dark, you know, and finally it gets light and I can see this is a big nine pointer and he's chasing this doe below me and, and, uh, man, I'm like, I thought to myself, I had a pond just above me, and I thought to myself, man, that, he's going to chase her along that ridge, you know, he's got, it was kind of that lockdown, but, you know, he was keeping her right in there, and I'm like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get a crack of this deer, that's what I normally think, but I had that pond right there, I'm like, I'm in the, I'm in the cards, man, this is awesome, because I knew that that pond being there was my saving grace, like, yeah, maybe they were going to run by me, but I knew they were going to come to that pond, sure enough, they did, that doe came to the pond, the buck was right behind her, they were both drinking, and it was game over. But, you know, a lot of people think of water holes early season, you know, take advantage of them. Then, yeah, that's great. Water holes can be really great year round, especially during the rut and even later season. I mean, deer got to drink. If you have them in the right spots, you know, as long as they're not frozen, deer are going to use them. Yeah, I'm in 100% in agreement with that. And I would actually argue that they're more important during the rut because, Yes, it's true that, oh, you know, it's hot out, it's 75 degrees, it's 80 degrees or whatever, the first part of the season, they're going to come, they want to come to that water and drink, and that's fantastic. But when they're running and rutting and all, they're burning, they're, you know, just burning huge amounts of food and water. They quit, basically quit eating, and they're, you know, they're hot. They're running around in the timber, running, 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 and they need that water even worse. And so do the does because they're getting pushed all over the place and they need water more. Some certainly some of the best rut hunts I've ever had, or but you know, best hunts during that time frame are over uh, little tiny kill ponds like that. They're amazing because they've got. I don't. I can't even count how many times I've seen bucks just. You hear them. You first you hear them. You know, hundred yards away, you just hear that, and they're headed to that pond. And then you look up and here he's, he's got his tongue hanging out and just panting. You know, he's just whooped. He's been running all over the place, and I gotta get a dang drink. And they'll go right in, wade in. Ask Colton Hall about this. They'll they'll wade right into their shoulders and just drink and drink and drink and drink. You know, because they've been just running and running during the rut. Yeah, they're super important during the rut and the pre-rut for sure. And because of that communication aspect too. You know, you think about during the pre-rut, all those bucks are walking around in the timber, literally peeing like every five minutes or less pissing all over the place, marking their territory, marking their territory. Well, what does it take to do that? Water. <laughs> you can't do that if you don't have water. They've got to hit those ponds more. And they're fantastic locations for uh, trail cameras, too. Amazing locations to pick up. You know, e- you'll know, you get every buck in that area hitting that pond, for sure. As yeah, long as you can get in, and I, I love to try and try and make it a stealthy setup, but if you can get in and get out without, or use a cell cam, one or the other, get in and get out without messing it up too bad, you know. Uh, we we did a trick with Colton's uh, buck, Mister Maybe. He drove a fence post into the into the pond about six feet from the bank, and so he would literally get into the pond and wade around the edge of the pond to get to that fence post and pull the card, so that he never set a single footprint anywhere within you know say thirty feet of the the three scrapes that were on the edge of the pond. It was an awesome trick. You can see that fence post in his uh, hunt on uh, the hunt for Megatron. The buck that he shoots at the end of Hunt, hunt for Megatron, look, there's a fence post right next to him. Nice. That's cool. Yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> so summer food. So just thinking about this past week, the neighbor had 40 extra plum trees, and he said, do you want them? Well, I'm not going to pass them up, so I put in 40 plum trees. Um, mm-hmm. You know, not in an area where I plan to hunt because it's more of that summer food. But what is your thought on that? I know a lot of people add apple trees and you know, just di- different kind Chestnuts. of fruit trees to yep. their around their plots or to certain areas, but typically that fruit does not correlate with hunting season. So, what is your thought on 
you know, having that as like a sweetener, not necessarily. Yeah. Well, that's one of the, know, certainly one of the components, the you know, we, we do recommend uh, for sure is, um, I don't really recommend apple trees, but crab apple trees are fantastic. You know, a- apples work too, but I think crab apples are better because generally they outproduce apples by a bunch as far as tonnage. And they're also smaller apples that, you know, the deer can eat a little bit easier. But definitely what you said, you know, picking uh, crab apple varieties that mature during hunting season, or I'm sorry, drop during hunting season, that, that's a key component. You know, some crab apples are what they call raisining crab apples, where they just they just shrink and turn into a little raisin on the dang uh, tree, you know, and whatnot. Other ones, they actually drop, and they're larger crab apples, and that, like Whitney and some of those other crab apples, those are fantastic because they drop during hunting season. The deer will lock on them. But the only thing I would say is if you're, you know, if you're going to try and plant fruit trees around your food plots or, you know, basically anywhere on your farm, you've got to put a cage around them. I'd put six foot uh, fencing cages around them. I usually use like 12 and a half feet because that makes a four foot circle. Sorry, I'm on some weird tangent, but anyway, uh, but that, that, that makes a cage around that tree so that um, the deer can't approach it and scrape it all to heck, you know, kind of deal. And then we usually put, um, uh, corrugated pipe on the lower part because a lot of times rabbits and those voles will uh, girdle the bark right there and then you got nothing. The tree's dead as soon as you do it, so or as soon as they do it. But yeah, I highly recommend uh, you know chestnuts and apples, crab apples and stuff around your uh, uh, plots. I haven't had quite as much experience with plum, but have had a lot of guys plant uh, pear trees. Not as highly recommended to me because they end up a lot of times cracking and breaking. They're quite a brittle tree oh, okay they don't seem to last as long S- sometimes they do but i don't know they, they're not to me the little crab apples do fantastic and, and and there's crab that actually drop in october mm-hmm. seems like around here they drop before that and our season opens up mid-september and it's still hard to get apples to uh-huh. stay on the tree you're in october yeah first even in november Iowa. even november there's several okay. varieties you know through october and november and that's what you want you want them dropping while you're you know, the, another reason why chestnuts can be so effective is because they're the same window. They're dropping in that same window, and the deer just love them. I'd recommend chestnuts even over apples for sure, or crab apples for sure. And so are you planting this, like, in the plots, around the plots, in a separate area towards destination? I don't want to I don't want to unlock the AWS secret here with all these yeah, tips yeah. and it's tactics. Not a big, but... It's not a big deal. I don't <laughs> plant an awful lot of trees. I recommend them sometimes. But, um, I, you know, a lot of guys do it on the edges. Some will do a few out in the middle. Um, you know, um, then you're planting around them, and, right? Yeah. So, which isn't a huge deal, but it is a little something. It's just it's be more personal preference than anything. You can do both. Um, you, you the edge has a problem in that you don't get as near as good of airflow. And fruit trees are, you know, they're. I'm sure you're on the farm. You noticed when they have bad airflow, they just don't do as well. They get a lot of crazy stuff, different fire blight and all these diseases and things. And they do a lot better when they got great airflow and and full sunshine. So. The middle of the plot has a little bit of a detraction and you got to you got to till around them and things but then you get a better payoff because the tree's a lot healthier so it's kind of it's kind of both some of each would is what i usually recommend yeah. especially if you got on on the like on the kind of the northern side so they get that great southern exposure they're going to get mostly full sun and do pretty well just uh, i wouldn't plant them uh, more than 35 yards from your tree stand if you've got a tree stand in that location which you should, probably should <laughs> Yeah, I know that was a key thing that, you know, folks who grown up hunting in Pennsylvania, you know, more of the, the suburban type hunting, bigger timber, not a lot of ag, um, you know, property that we couldn't really put in food plots. I mean, that was always, I felt like you out there, JJ, you're always finding apple trees, but that was always a key thing that we, we tried to focus on and find was these apple trees that were, you know, gnarly and baked into the, the, the timber and you go in there and you trim them and you clean them up a little bit and, you know, it try to increase that production. And, and that's something that we always took advantage of, you know, during that early bowl season, the beginning of October, you still get some apples dropping on the ground can be a really, really good target area for, for deer, especially when, Unlike here in the Midwest, they have a lot of other options for, for good food sources. So that was always a really good one that we took advantage of early was those apple trees that are especially in the timber. You get plenty of those on the, on the farm, don't you? Yeah, the problem is we didn't choose any of them, so we don't, know the, we don't even know what variety they are. Yeah. There's about a bazillion varieties of apples, crab apples, all kinds of stuff. Um, yeah, and generally a lot of times when they're in timber like that, just growing in amongst other trees and whatnot, they don't they do not do especially well or produce a lot. Some, some of them are pretty. Prolific. You'll see them. You will see them today, Andy. You'll just see white clouds. This is the week, this is the week to scout apple trees. Nice. Just look around for white. 
JJ's favorite find, weekly. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Plum, yeah, JJ Appleseed. Like, yeah. There's an apple, plum, apple, yeah, right? Just pop. But yeah, the white no, flowers are pretty. Yeah, giving away pretty they're good. They're beautiful too. But mm -hmm. anyway, what's the next little habitat, Brian? You wanted well, to dive into cover a little bit. Yeah, we are running out of time, but let's dive into cover for sure. Um, you know, cover is another huge element that that can hold deer on your property, and, and you can make a difference in adding cover. Um, you know, you can do it in several ways. You can do it in different grasses. You can do it in, you know, with cedars. You can do it with hinge cutting. So, Andy, tell me about you know how you approach some of these properties and adding cover to hold some of these deer. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, right off the bat, obviously, hinge cutting has. We, we recommend a lot of hinge cutting. I do a lot of hinge cutting, and um, you know, it has a giant cover component it's it's a huge element of what it does it's not the most important element in my opinion the food aspect of, of what it does is more important especially for deer horn size and whatnot um but it, it definitely has a huge cover component and that's the first you know element of the framework for sure that we always recommend on farms and um you know picking out where those places are going to be where you're going to put that cover and that hinge cutting that's that's super important from a food cover a food uh, component and a cover component and then uh, obviously switchgrass is, you know, we've had tremendous luck using um, good, tall switchgrass uh, as cover for deer. Um, they don't really, I don't think they prefer a, a completely homogenous field of switchgrass, in my opinion. They don't, uh, they don't move through it very well if it's all just uh, completely hinge, um, uh, switchgrass. But if you, you know, you, you, when you have a field of switchgrass like that and you start cutting trails through it, then you've just, you've created an unbelievable magnet for deer. They really... They, they love being able to move through it quietly like that. They've still got all the cover and they're hidden, you know, their entire body's hidden and whatnot. Um, really important to, to try and pick a, a um, switchgrass variety that uh, doesn't fall down if you, you know, depending on your snows and whatnot. I know you guys get a, a lot of heavy snows here and whatnot. So you, you got to get a variety that won't get crushed and compressed by the snow. That's a, that's a huge problem. Uh, a lot of guys have, you know, different kinds of grasses and whatnot, and they all just, by the end of winter, they're all just flat as a pancake on the ground. Well, that does absolutely nothing for deer, obviously. Need to get a good variety, and we use, recommend a lot of that cave and rock switchgrass. It's fantastic, and uh, that's another component of cover and whatnot. And then, like, as you spoke about cedars and, uh, you know, a lot of guys using the miscanthus and whatnot grasses now, those are all... A lot of those are done more for screening and components and whatnot. They're a little expensive to just be thinking about, oh, I'm going to put a bunch in this field to add some cover. You know, it's pretty expensive. So, But a lot of guys will get tree spades, you know, like on your farm, get tree spades involved uh, uh, to move some cedars to a certain area. Uh, that can be done pretty inexpensively if you go out for spend a whole day uh, pulling, uh, using a tree spade, pulling cedars, and you maybe you put them around your tree stand or an area where you're exposed trying to get to a tree stand or an area where you've got neighbors that can look into a, someplace you want a food plot and you want to put a bunch of deer but you don't want everybody looking at them kind of situations like that so all, all the same kind of thing that we spoke about before you know they're all aspects of things you can do to improve your property if it's 20 acres 100 acres 500 acres whatever those are all those cover components are definitely they're they're a super important part of all that well, I think the cool thing is too is is a challenge you if you're out there thinking about doing any of these things think about what you said, Annie, before. Think about the flow and how they all work together. So, you know, you can put in a food plot, you can put in a water hole, and you can put in cover, but you can do it strategically so that they all work together. You can bed your deer, make them feed here, and make them water hole here, or at least entice them to do that. Mm -hmm. Give them those resources, and we've talked about it lots throughout this podcast. Give them everything that they need right in one area and then take advantage of it, but do it where you can take advantage to hunt them. You know, so right. think about how you can use all these things together. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about is stacking all these elements, you know, to put the deck in your favor. You just exactly described my business. That's exactly it. For sure. Using, for hire. using all those components <laughs> for sure to, to with, with the end focus always being to increase your advantage as a hunter, you know, because you're doing all these things for the deer and that's fantastic. But if at the end of the day, if you don't have huntable system, huntable situations, then, then you end up thinking, well, why did I do it that way? Why didn't I put, you know, so that creating those things with the focus all the time on, all right, how's the hunter going to take advantage of this? Does he have a good approach to, you know, what tree stands are you going to be in? Is there a backup tree? Just all these different factors, you know. JJ, before we wrap up here, what, uh, what have you seen work good for cover? What are some of the things that you've implemented there in Whitetails from Scratch property or seen in the past? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, obviously, Andy came and hinge cut it, and that cover in the timber was has worked really well. I was going to comment on one thing that you said earlier about uh, the cave and, you know, the switchgrass versus other varieties. Mm -hmm. 
in Wisconsin at that property, um, the DNR, I believe it was the DNR, put in a bunch of grass mixed for Jay and the, and the family. And it's great. Like all summer, it looks beautiful. Big blue stem and great mix. And then in mm-hmm. the fall, it just falls flat. Yeah. Big heavy rain, heavy winds. You don't even need snow and it's just flat. Yeah. So then you lose, I mean, it just turns into absolute unusable space for most creatures. Mm-hmm. And then you're just trying to balance that with, you know, the switchgrass, which you said hard to walk through. So that's like the river, that's the opposite, almost sometimes too thick where you got to mow through it and whatnot. And then mm-hmm. I've seen people with the pheasants forever mixes where they have a bunch of flowers and the little blue. And then it's like you see, yeah, pollinator mixes. you can see through it, you know, 40 yards. Mm-hmm. So there's, it's not holding as, so it's almost like it's, it's hard to pick all, you know, the best possible mix out of that. Yeah, K- I really, Caven Rock is, you know, in my opinion, is the best possible mix out of that. And then mowing trails into it where you want them. And, and you know, also having areas where you don't plant necessarily, whatever it would. You can really, really move deer with that stuff. It, it's great. You know, when you've got hinge cutting and whatnot close by, and then you've got some areas that you want good cover. Because th- the deal is deer feel extremely secure when they're in it. But there has they have to be able to move through it. And, and I have seen it so thick where the deer just, they just won't use it. They'll go around it because it's so dense and thick that they make a lot of noise moving through it and they don't really like it that much. But the second you start mowing trails through it, just basic, you know, whatever, eight foot wide trails and mow them with curves so the coyotes can't, you know, look just down a straight edge 500 yards and see if there's deer down there and get all interested, you know. I'm, uh, we always recommend just have have some curves to it so they they can only see 30 or 40 yards or whatever and they become giant instantaneous magnets for deer because they want to move through it, number one, quietly, and number two, easy. And you can move around it. Yes, you can. Uh, tons of clients take advantage of, of those trails. R- ask Ryan about that. He's it, it, the, the trail systems he's got leading to tree stands through CRP are amazing. Have you ever put food plots in a big uh, switch mix where you got like uh, boxes of plots? Absolutely. Yeah. That's Absolutely. Again, your tree stand, you know, obviously your tree stand and your water hole component needs to be planned first with your access and everything. But yeah, for sure. That, that's top notch because the deer that are in the food plot feeding feel 100% secure because they've got cover all the way around. Nothing yeah. can see them. You know, they're in there eating nice green food and nothing can see them. That's super. Yeah, my mind racing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great component. And such great bedding cover for deer, you know, especially, you know, as it gets colder and colder, they love bedding in, uh, you know, switchgrass. That's what happens. They, they go down those trails and just, you know, kick off them 10, 15 yards into, the, into that CRP and, or that switchgrass, and they're, they're completely hidden, but they can be back on that trail in just a second or two, you know. How many sheds do you find in there? Oh, so many. <laughs> that was a After I burn it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. We were actually you on. find those special chocolatey sheds with the brown tips. <laughs> we, <laughs> they, they do that big shed hunting tournament over there in Wisconsin at Homegrown, and there's all these different farms. And we were walking through actually this, this Jeff's personal farm, and he's got a sea of switchgrass. And we're walking through there, and man, it's I, I and I'm sure there were sheds in there, but it was like he had to walk on top of them. And I, I yelled over to him, "Hey, I said, uh, how bad do you want to win this shed hunting tournament?" He's like, "Why is that?" I said, we could burn this whole field right now. I said, we'd find every shed. Find 150 of them. Yeah, he said, not that bad. <laughs> so, Well, right on. Well, that's exciting. Now is the time of year to be thinking about all these things. We're, we have the perfect opportunity, food plot season coming up here. You know, get out on your property. You can put in water holes. Take advantage of doing these things and strategizing them now so that two, three months down the road, you're not scrambling to do it when it's too late and you want to be taking that pressure off of your property. So... Think about these things. Think about how you can not only stack the odds in your favor, but add several elements, stack them, and use them all to your advantage. Moving forward, hopefully give you some more success this fall. So, guys, thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. Download the free Deer Society app. Lots of tips, information, good content on there. So make sure you check that out. Appreciate you watching, listening. Anything else? Last thoughts? Thanks for the opportunity, Brian. Appreciate it, guys. The Deer Society's success has been built on great partnerships with great product makers, such as Illusion Systems, maker of the Extinguisher Deer Call, the Black Rack Rattling System, and the Phase Body Odor System. 
Tacticam and Reveal, Osseo Gear, 10 Point Crossbows, Burris Optics, Huiman, and Big Frig.